about a year ago, I was at a conference and I get a phone call from Matthew LaCroix and he's all pumped up. He's excited. He's telling me he might have found the key to all civilizations on the entire planet. I started digging myself, and all of a sudden I said, wait a minute, there, there might be something here. I could see that the symbology there was uh, out of time. I think to find you know, what you would might call the source would be ab absolutely profound. A lost era civilization around Lake Vaughan is that missing link. Hey everyone, I'm Billy Carson, AKA Forbidden Knowledge. And I'm here to talk about the Lost Ararat Project, a brand new project where these amazing souls are here to help us discover untold truths and hidden truths about the world we live in today and how it's tied to the ancient past. I'm here with, of course, Matthew LaCroix, best-selling author. I'm here with Brian Forster, the worldwide known researcher and archeologist, and of course, Paul Anthony Wallace, another best-selling author. And today we're going to talk about this Ararat project and how you could also be involved with us and help us get to a point where we can release this to the world and help change our reality on this planet. Welcome, gentlemen, to this uh, incredible podcast. It's an honor to be here with you all. Thank you, Billy. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Billy. You know, one of the things uh, we were just talking about off off air was the fact that uh, about a year ago, I was at a conference and I get a phone call from Matthew LaCroix and he's all pumped up. He's excited. He's telling me he might have found the key to all civilizations on the entire planet. I know Matthew, when he gets hyped, he gets excited. You know, you got to kind of pay attention because he doesn't really get excited like that that often. I mean, he you know, he knows the stuff. He has his wheelhouse that he's in. But when he gets pumped like that, you got to kind of like, wait a minute, let me let me pay attention. And so uh, I listened to him a little bit more, and then a few months later, a little bit more, and finally, I started digging myself, and all of a sudden I said, wait a minute, there, there might be something here. And Matthew just was so passionate about this, he really began to formulate and put this whole thing together to the point that we're sitting here right now about a year later talking about it, not only, not only talking about it, but actually raising funds to produce an incredibly high-quality produced documentary that's going to help change the world. Matthew, you want to talk a little bit, let the people know a little bit about what got you so excited and why we're on this journey right now. Thank you, Billy. That was well said. In that time frame that you and I had that first conversation when I was in LA that time and I yeah. called you and I was like, I, you know, I said, you know, I found this ancient site, Zernaki Tepe. And I said, it's got these strange polygonal walls and megalithic designs that look really similar to South America and has these mysterious origins, but I don't have any evidence to prove my theories of it connecting to an ancient Sumerian Noah connection because Mount Ararat was right there, but I had theories. And what was strange about that was instead of having something bend to that theory, I actually sort of forgot about it for a little while. I went off and I was doing other projects and all of a sudden other things came into my life where I realized the scope of that discovery and how big it was. And it blossomed to potentially being what could be the first cross on earth, the first chalice, the first iconography from the tree of life and the Sumerian depictions like we see with God Haldi and the lion and all of these ancient triptych teachings we see around the world. It started to grow bigger and bigger. Mm. And before I knew it, a film was being talked about by a lot of people. And it was something that was brought up to me. And we, we thought, you know what, this is big enough and has enough evidence to truly change history. And I called mm. Billy and I was like, Billy, I really want you to be a part of this, man. And we talked about it and we went over it. And he's like, you know what, I'm in. And then I called Brian and Paul and we got together and we said, if we want to do this right, we have to represent expertise from a wide variety of areas. If we're mm -hmm. going to say something biblical about a first cross, we need Paul Wallace there extensive mm -hmm. background in, in the church. If we want to talk about something megalithic and its precision, we need the world expert on megaliths, Brian Forrester. Mm -hmm. When we want to talk about ancient, ancient timelines and connections, we need Billy Carson there. We, what we need is to create a dream team to tell this message in the way that it needs to be told. And that's what we're trying to do right now because we've already raised an enormous amount of money, but we're not done yet. So Billy, that's that's just a little bit of an, a, an understanding of this, but the project mm -hmm. will be us going on the ground to make discoveries around Lake Vaughn in Turkey 
uh, Ankara, Turkey, at a museum with an ancient relic hiding in the basement there, as well as flying across the world to Brian's wheelhouse area in Tiwanaku Pumupunku in Bolivia, Lake Titicaca. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be a film that goes all around the world to make discoveries and truly yeah. change history and connect people to a lost aspect and origin point that we forgot thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's going to be amazing. What I'd like to do is real quick, just kind of go around and have each one of us tell a little bit about some of our expertise and what our wheelhouse is and what we're passionate about. So Brian, if you would like to start, for those who don't really know who you are or what you do, can you just give a quick summary? Sure. I've been fascinated by ancient <clears throat> mysteries since I was a young boy. And, um, and so that led me to do a lot of traveling. I've been to about 100 countries, but I decided about 15 years ago to base myself in Peru because it is the most enigmatic little country in the world. The site we're going to be looking at in Bolivia is called Puma Punku and Tiwanaku. They're actually both the same location. It's just they have different fences around them. And no one honestly knows who built them. The standard story is that the Tiwanaku civilization constructed these locations between 100 AD and 1000 AD, but it's clearly impossible because they were constructed using very advanced machining technology, which to some degree we can't replicate today. That's basically my background is a, a focus on megalithic sites, megalithic uh, structures, lost ancient machining technology. Beautiful, incredible. And Mr. Paul Anthony Wallace, amazing best-selling author of the Eden series. Can you talk a little bit about your passion, your history in the church and how you got to the point you are now? Sure. Well, I start off by saying uh, that just like you, Billy, I remember the conversation I had with Matt when he introduced the concept uh, of this movie to me. I was interviewing Matt for Fifth Kind TV. And as you say, Matthew is always enthusiastic for his work and his yeah. finds, but this really was off the chart. And for that interview, I really only had to ask about four questions and we had two hours of material. And I could see that Matthew really did have something with these finds in what was ancient Armenia. And uh, we looked together at the symbology on this ancient relic that he mentioned that's currently housed in Ankara. And that really grabbed me because I could see that the symbology there was uh, out of time, uh, out of place with all the timelines that we have for the history of humanity and the history of thought. And I was fascinated by the appearance of these ancient crosses, these ancient chalices, ancient griffins and trees of life. And I thought, okay, Matt, Matthew's got something here. And then Matthew started talking about the dates and I was thinking, oh, it, well, that could be right. I'm, I'm not sure. So I went back to my research, to my wheelhouse, which is ancestral narratives, the interpretation of ancient texts. And that's my background. My background, as you say, Billy, is in church ministry. I was for 33 years in church-based mm -hmm. ministry training pastors as a theological educator, mm. and I trained them in hermeneutics, the principles of interpreting ancient texts and the history of Christian thought. I was a church doctor in that time and an archdeacon for the Anglican Church in Australia. So that's my background. And all that work, well, the church doctor forced me to engage with um, experiences that are very stretching, that take you into the paranormal and begin to stretch your worldview and your understanding of who and what we all are, but all the time engaging with ancient texts. When I went back to my ancient texts, just to go over in my mind what Matt had told me, I began to realize, oh my goodness, I think Matt is absolutely over the target here. Because I think what a lot of biblical scholars um, have missed and many others have noticed, but have to mention softly, softly, very gently, is that we may have geographically misplaced the origins of many of our ancient narratives in the Bible. Uh, conventionally, we're looking in southern Mesopotamia. We're looking at the emergence of the Bible from out of annals of ancient Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria. 
and we miss the vital role that ancient Armenia played in the story of humanity. If we're going to take seriously the global recollection of a, a population reboot at some point, we have to go into Armenia. If we want to look at significant leaps forward in uh, the human story, uh, building with brick, uh, iron technology, material science, we have to go to ancient Armenia. And when you start probing the, the root meanings of key words, you'll find geographically that will take you into the high country of Ararat. It will take you into ancient Armenia. And I believe that there are stories of human origins deeply embedded in the Bible, which have often been mistranslated and that place us geographically exactly where Matt is taking us in this movie. So after I'd done a bit of homework, having interviewed Matt, I knew, oh my goodness, I've got to be involved with this. Not only because it helps to rewrite where we think our ancient texts have come from, but because when we get into, into the symbology to be found on these ancient artifacts in these ancient sites, it takes us to a time that predates every religion on the planet. Mm. predates the Judeo-Christian tradition, predates every wisdom tradition, and takes us to the experience of our ancestors in the deep, deep past. And timelines is something I'm sure we're going to be discussing at length in this movie, uh, to the root of where so many of these experiences and aspirations of mankind really come from. Yeah, amazing. And wow. this oh. is why you're on the team, because that extensive knowledge that that also that experience in the church it's so important to have that level of balance because you have to take that level of knowledge which can be uh in a lot of cases um you know go it can go against uh the timeline the new timeline we're trying to establish but you're a person that's been there done that and have seen beyond and realized wait a minute something doesn't make any sense so for us, it's really important to have someone like you on the team as well to help us to be to create the ability to have other people see with different eyes and actually understand, wait a minute, this man has done all of this stuff in the church for decades. Now, all of a sudden, he's helping to stretch this timeline. We got to pay attention here. So thank you. Thank you. And then, of well, course, we you. have Matthew LaCroix, who's coming on board, who's really the founder of this entire movement. And so, Matthew, uh, after you, I'll tell a little, bit, a little bit more about myself, but what got you into the passion of ancient civilizations? Because when I first met you, you were an engineer that was already an expert on ancient text. I was like, this guy's an engineer, but he's he's doing ancient text. He's got to be, he should be doing this full time. He's too good. How did you find this path to where you are right now? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Billy. And Paul, that was beautifully said. I, yeah. um, I, it, I could not have said it better myself. That's what we're trying to do. If everything he said, and and I just want to mention, Paul actually came out to film when he did Open Minds of Gaia, and we got a chance to go hiking and spend the whole day together. And we talked all about the ancient symbols and our thoughts about it and reflections on if, if there's any holes we could try to find or things we could try to figure out that we just didn't understand. And it was a mm -hmm. profound conversation. And Paul and I really got to the heart, I feel like, of a lot of these mysteries and tried to un uncover them. But that's what it really is trying to understand a mystery. And I have to give a lot of credit to a man that's on this call right now for my journey. Um, I mean, not only Billy Carson for coming and pulling me out of a, a more like unknown state, but in terms of someone to focus me on that path, to go down on that road, Brian Forster is undoubtedly one of the most important people in that for me. Because mm. Brian, what he did is he would go to these sites he would say, look, I'm not going to show you any fancy stuff with graphics or anything. I'm just going to point out to you with an expertise, showing you the angles, the perfection of these blocks, and then showing you the contrast of the more primitive work above it. And mm -hmm. I want to show you the difference and show you that that narrative, that they're both created by the same civilization, does not hold up and does not make mm -hmm. sense. And he, more than anyone else on this planet, has gone to more megalithic sites to document what is not aligning with history and what falls into this lost narrative than anyone else in the world. 
So I want to commend him for that, that mission. And so it's a truly an honor to have him a part of this, to take his knowledge of Egypt and Peru and Bolivia and Mexico and other places around the world, take it, go to what might be the origin point and see if he can verify that for us. And Brian is very casual to say much, but I know that Brian is interested. He's very curious and we're going to take him to these sites and that's how we're truly going to change history is by bringing experts like Paul and Billy and Brian and, and me to get there and actually be in, mm-hmm. on the ground. And so that's really what started me is this curiosity and wonder for this. And I think I just want to mention what Billy said is, is I think why I became connected with this discovery is because I was obs- obsessed truly with the Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian and Chaldean accounts of history. So I would read every single version of those cuneiform tablets. And of course, Sumerian is not the same language as Akkadian and Assyrian. They share they share a wedge like design of their writing, but they don't share the same language. And so you're actually reading different language versions of those ancient stories. But most of those stories had an origin point, had an origin point of talking about either whether or not our almost like our creation origin point or an origin point talking about these events and when they first happened and what happened to us. And mm-hmm. those stories go back to these ancient Sumerian kings. And the last Sumerian king, known as Tanapishtim or Zayasudra, who has very, very such strong correlations that any kind of biblical or ancient history expert agrees that it was derived, the, the Christian religious version of the Noah story and the flood was originally derived from the Sumerian version of the Atrahasis, And then later, the Epic of Gilgamesh combination with what's also called the Legend of Itzubar. And those all contain nearly identical flood stories from an ancient Sumerian lineage, last king, who survived this catastrophe. And of course, Gilgamesh in that story goes and seeks out the the Noah figure to to try to learn the secrets of immortality. But remember, in the story, this last Sumerian king, Noah figure, with his, his family members, these bloodline descendants of him, Instead of thinking of it like the Russell Crowe movie where he's like got like a primitive clothing on, we need to think of it more as looking at it as he was an ancient priest and a king. Okay? That's what the text describe him as. An ancient priest and a king, just like Asher Bonapal was, who was trying to preserve and protect history and had an ancient lineage bloodline that was described as needing to be preserved. And this text described him as landing either on Mount Ararat or the mountains around Mount Ararat, which is what's so perplexing because they just disappeared from a lot of, of the hist- of history records. We had biblical accounts of what those lines might have been, but we didn't have any archaeological evidence to back any of it. Or that it was from an older time period than we're told, like Paul says. And that was when these discoveries, looking at finding Cavus Tepe and Ionis Temple and Kef Temple and the underwater ruins under, under Lake Vaughan, that discovery became real because we had tangible evidence of those bloodlines written in, in basalt stone, cuneiform, in the stones, talking about the bloodlines, the ancient kings, the same depictions that with the winged gods like from Sumer. Same depictions being lowered there. It all started to connect in a way where I realized this is huge. This is not something I can I can take on alone. And that's mm-hmm. why I brought on these these experts, these gentlemen, yeah. as well as an incredible director, two producers, one of them who's done high budget Hollywood films with like Robert De Niro and Bradley Cooper. We have incredible talent on this. And a team that is going to bring this story to life and embody it in humanity to try to teach us what we've truly lost. And that's what I believe the lost era as civilization, as I'm coining it, around Lake Vaughn is that missing link. Incredible, incredible. So well spoken, so well said. And of course, I'm Billy Carson. My biggest claim to fame is I've been able to make a lot of connections around the world, uh, see beyond not only mainstream, but even into deeply into a lot of the ancient texts and tablets Everything through uh, from, from Sumeria, dealing with the Enumi Elish and the seven tabs of creation, the Epic of Atrasis, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Code of Hammurabi, the Myth of Adapa, and just so many more tabs that exist. And seeing through them and understanding that in a lot of cases, the beings or the people being spoken about there, these, these people, and I do mean people, <laughs> were connected to other sites all around the world. And even in indigenous cultures, 
with verbal handed down histories like the Aboriginals or the Lakota tribe or the Hopi tribe and so forth all around the world, I began to realize that we ourselves are potentially all sitting and standing on top of Atlantis, that Atlantis was most likely a global civilization that had an origin point. And the, the, the you know the reason behind this movie is we're investigating. This is a this is an investigative report, basically. We're gonna go and find out is this the origin point that we think it is of the building and spreading out around the world of the Atlantean civilization. Uh, and I, I really do believe that, Matthew, you found something special here, and I'm looking forward to digging into this research, going to these ancient sites, and working to make these amazing connections. And you guys and gals, the viewers, can help us make this a reality. You can help us bring this to fruition by supporting. There'll be a link in the caption of this video or this audio podcast, wherever you find it. Click that link, and you can actually become a partner with us and help us put this film out. By making a small donation of $100, you can actually uh, be listed as a sponsor on our, our page, on the website itself. By making a donation of, I believe, $600, it's you can actually have your, $500, yeah. I'm sorry, you can have your name as a credit in the actual film. So you'll get a film credit, which is incredible. We'll give you a special thanks also when the film is listed on IMDb, which I'm an expert at setting up those IMDb pages and for, for films and productions, because I'm a producer. I'll make sure that those names of those donors go on as an IMDb credit for special thanks as well. So you'll get a special thanks on IMDb. And of course, you'll also get your name listed as a donor on the website. So you'll be part of a film. You'll be, you'll be part of helping bring something to the world. If you've been sitting around saying, man, I wish I could be a part of these things. I wish I can get my information out to the world. I wish I could find a way to help people or change uh, the paradigm. Well, you can help by making a small sacrifice and becoming part of a financial commitment to us to help us get out there and bring this to the world in a very, very high level way. I'm talking about the highest level, not just a YouTube production, but a full blown movie level production that can really uh, give an impact to people who you may want to show it to that may think uh, there's a lot of conspiracies and this is, you know, to woo woo. But all of a sudden you bring them a high level production like this, they almost have to pay attention. Right. They have to watch. And thanks to produ producers and uh, like Prometheus and others that have produced, you know, shows like Ancient Aliens and many others that have lasted for 19, 20 years. Thankfully, those productions we know will catch the mind and hearts of people when they're produced with a high level of quality. And that's what we are aiming to bring here right now. And so it'll be uh, airing in different locations that that those specifics haven't been put out yet. But we're going to bring it to the world in a way that hasn't been done before. And so, Matthew, I know that um, this has been now, Matt, this has become your passion project. And it's really amazing how the universe works because all of a sudden you've got a lot of time to focus on this, which is pretty amazing. Uh, you know, and which is a, it's a blessing. It, right. You know, everything happens in divine time. The fact that all four of us can be on this screen at the same time in four different time zones is also a blessing. You know, these things, these kind of alignments only happen, all, you know, only a few times in a person's lifespan and this alignment of our timelines actually crisscrossing and actually connecting has happened here now and everyone who's viewing this right now you have a chance to be a part of something really special you have a part a chance to be a part of something that's going to help change the consciousness of humanity on this planet i have a quick question for brian by the way so brian i know you're an expert on the megaliths uh and you've been looking at a lot of these stone structures for literally decades. I mean, your work has been so inspiring. And what types of stones have you seen out there in terms of like, you know, crystal granite, uh, diorite, what kind of stones actually exist at some of these ancient sites? Well, I would say the predominant ones are uh, basalt, which mm -hmm. is a volcanic material quite high in, um, in iron. There's also andesite, which generally is located around the Andes Mountains, but uh, can be located in other parts of the world. And granite is a very general term for um, a broad range of different stones like uh, diorite and granodiorite and other stones like that, which you predominantly find in Egypt. So we're basically looking at volcanic stone that has a tendency to be high in quartz content and also in some cases iron as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, very hard though, right, Brian? Like not a soft. And always, number. always hard. Always six to seven out of ten on the most scale, where ten is diamond. So you're you're talking stone that cannot be cut by anything less than advanced technology. We're wondering why how Bronze Age civilizations could have could have been credited with doing any of that work, right? Well, true, exactly. That's the point. All right. Incredible. And one thing that I found, and I'll be bringing along with me a Geiger counter. Uh, just to measure background radiation, we've got to see, you know, what level of radiation is coming out of some of these stones. From my experience visiting, visiting some of these megalithic sites, I find that certain stones have more radiation coming out of them than others. And in most cases, there's more radiation than background. So uh, some of these stones have, are still radioactive, which is pretty interesting. Um, you know, could they have been able to use or harness some of that radioactivity in some of the construction process. We know that these ancient builders were very, very revolutionary in their thinking and use of tools. Uh, they thought way outside, forget the box, they thought outside of the universe in terms of how to utilize tools and stone. Uh, and I'm wondering if we can find or figure out if there's any connection between the ambient radiation and some of the ways that they actually were able to manipulate and mold these stones and get them to interlock together, cut them, hoist them up and everything else. So it's going to be a great investigation when we go out there to start investigating uh, these stones. One thing I found out recently is that, you know, sandstone, basalt, for example, they have a, a particular, well, all stones have a particular resonant frequency, but the particular resonant frequency of basalt and sandstone, depending on the magnetic field and also radiation, can be amped up or stepped up to higher uh, kilohertz. And when they get to a specific hertz, kilohertz, they can actually transmit frequencies which allow which can then piggyback data so you can actually get to a communications level of communi uh, of transportation uh, tra uh, transmitting information you get a, com a communications level of transmitting information i should say i'm sorry through stepping up the ambient frequency of some of these stones which means they may be even be able to communicate directly through stone which is something even mind-blowing so it it's going to be incredible i'm looking forward to it Brian, uh, it's going to be wild. What are your thoughts on the types of stone used? Like we talked about, different types of igneous and metamorphic rocks, but specifically basalt and andesite. Do you have any thoughts on why they might use that? You mentioned high iron content, um, maybe like a type of magnetism that's possible at some of these locations. But I just wanted you to just mention that your thoughts on that because what are the chances? And this is what's kind of bizarre is that. I like to think, think of myself as someone who studied well under you, and I'm not aware of, of any other or very few other sites, if any, besides Tiwanaku Pumapunku that used andesite in an extensive way besides Ionis and the, and, those, and the era civilization is Turkey. It's like they were mirroring each other, and there are other comparisons we can make with the lake depths and other things as well with the mountains. But is your what are your thoughts on seeing so many megalithic sites, as, as I said, with basalt andesite, is there like an energetic function? What are your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there seems to be a direct relationship between um, energy or vibration and the type of stone material. So the denser a stone you have, the more resonant or vibrational its characteristics tend to be. So that's why basalt or basalt and uh, andesite. Uh, are very good candidates for, for setting up a vi even a vibrational field because some of the mm. structures, ancient uh, megalithic structures in, in Peru around the city of Cusco, there is an obvious, um, <clears throat> there used to be an obvious um, vibrational field that was created after the construction of the site itself. So when you would walk inside the structure, you would literally go into an alternate state of consciousness. That's where that's yes. where our term um, alter comes from. It's from alternate state, which of course Paul would know all about. So yeah, hmm. I Amazing. I love what Brian just said about the properties of these sites that are constructed of particular stone and the properties of stone with particular iron content and how it impacts the the human experience in those sites, it just reminded me of what Plato had to say about ancient and previous civilizations. When he gets onto the topic of the prior civilization, the Atlantean civilization, he says specifically that they were experts in metallurgy. And I noted earlier that you go into ancient Armenia 
And the ancients remember the people who lived there for being the pioneers of iron technology. Now, when we hear pioneers of iron technology or experts in metallurgy, you and I probably think, oh, okay, so they were building things like the Eiffel Tower, were they? So that we will find this, this ironwork in the civil engineering, but we've made a huge assumption as to what they're using these metals for. And mm. I am coming to the conclusion that what Plato is referencing is not just civil engineering. He's talking about all the properties of these metals with which the ancients worked, and it has to do with health, and it has to do with altered states of consciousness. Mm, incredible. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you bring that up, Paul, because quick question. Now, a lot of people, believe it or not, that uh, you know have a, are part of a religion, Christianity mostly, they tend to believe that the cross is something that began just a couple thousand years ago. What, you know, can you talk a little bit about, about the origins of the cross being far older than the story of Jesus, a.k.a. Yeshua, in the Bible? Well, I'll, I'll give us sort of a bigger context for it, because uh, early in my career as a priest in the Church of England, I worked in a high church, Anglo-Catholic church, full of symbology and full of ceremony. So, I mean, there are types of church where there's there are no, there's no symbolism, there's no art, you're in a plain box, but this was at the other end of the spectrum. Everything was decorated, everything was symbology. And I was taught all the Christian interpretations for the symbology we were using, you know, what the altar meant, why we had an altar stone that had to be ancient why we had a little cupboard in the corner where we would keep a piece of consecrated bread and why there'd be a candle flying over it. Why, when the bishop turned up, he would be vested in purple, why he would be carrying a stick shaped like a shepherd's crook, why he would mm -hmm. wear a skull cap, why we would do processions, uh, why we would wave incense. Everything had a Christian meaning. And yet, as I continued my theological journey, I realized that if somebody from ancient Rome had turned up and watched our procession, he would have said, oh, you got that perfect. Mm. And I can see who's in charge here. Uh, somebody from uh, uh, ancient Persia would turn up and say, oh, I can see who's in charge because he's wearing the royal purple chose by King Cyrus. Uh, in the 6th century BCE, uh, uh, somebody from uh, Second Temple Judaism would appear and say, oh, I can see you've got um, the, the showbread, just as we have. Mm -hmm. And bit by bit, I discover that all the symbology that I was familiar with was far older than Christianity, far older than Anglo-Catholicism, mm -hmm. and that these symbols all carry earlier meanings. I talk about this a bit in my book, The Eden Conspiracy, where we pick up a, a nous at Tel El Farah, which has uh, symbology etched over it. And conventionally, we would go and we would say, oh, we know what these symbols mean in uh, ancient Judaism. And we'll come up with an explanation that this is all about harvest festivals and, and, and when to hold them. But uh, symbology travels... Uh, a long way and often predates what we think its uh, usage might be. If you look at those so same symbols and ask what they mean in the root culture, which, as I mentioned before, is the culture of ancient Sumeria, those symbols all carry a different meaning. And we realize we're looking at a star map, identifying where the person referenced on that nous came from and how they got here. So there are all these layers of information. And so you go to the cross and you might say, oh, I know exactly what that means. Uh, that is a message about atonement. Well, in my work in the Eden series, I've shown that uh, atonement is not the correct framework for mm -hmm. the ancient Christian texts. That that's not how they discussed the cross. It did not mean that to them. And now when we get into ancient Armenia, we discover that the shape of the cross was carrying a meaning which predated Christianity by thousands of years. 
And I, I find this, this really appeals to my sense of humor because the message of the cross is so central to how we conventionally understand the Christian story. And yet, just like those other symbols I mentioned, it goes much further back and carries information from a far more ancient period in the human story. And that's one of the things I'm really looking to exploring on site uh, mm -hmm. when we get to those sites in the new year and drill down into what were the original associations? What did the cross yeah. mean before it got hijacked by a religion of uh, guilt, worship, obedience, and the need for atonement? Wow, that's going to be so powerful. <laughs> so, right. so powerful. And Matthew, you know, we have a book coming out now. It's finally done. Thank goodness it's done. <laughs> the Epic of Humanity. By the way, thank both of you, Brian and uh, and Paul, for uh, yeah, you know giving you a review on that book. We appreciate you so much. Uh, the book is finally here. Uh, and in this book, uh, uh, Matthew, we kind of really go and try to you know give people the true epic going way back in time and coming forward. And you know what you see in there is you see text, ancient text, ancient tablets. I've got papyrus and cylinder scrolls. We've got you know all this information in there. But they all seem to be interlinked, and the digger you, the, the deeper you dig, the further back you go. So what we're finding is we just keep kind of moving back and back to get to this origin point, which is what I think you've been able to do. When you started researching all these different tablets and all these different texts, did you ever foresee us going this far back in time? No, and actually one of the things that's been very interesting coming out of it is studying climatic events in Earth, studying the mm. younger Dryas, older Dryas, oldest Dryas, and then other climatic periods of ice ages and, and inter interglacial periods. Um, the conclusion I've had to come to is that studying that flood story that's in the original Sumerian narrative, the Atrahasis version, the original version, and then connecting it to the the ancient temples, like we're talking about with an altar, with the first cross, and these, these lineages that go back to these Sumerian kings, it's made me realize, wait a minute. So what we're talking about here is that civilization, as we're told in school, the doctrine is only 6,000 years old when we emerged out of being hunter-gatherers and, and, and started something different, right? Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, though. That, there's a problem now even in, in the sense of me connecting this to the younger Dryas because not only is that 12,000 years old and not, not only are you doubling that, but I don't even believe that it's from that event either because what we're told and, and what Paul is shaking his head, he knows over there is that in Plato's, the Timaeus and Critias, we know, we know that Solon was told by the temple priests of Sice. He was told to them by Sanchez said that there have been many, many destructions of ancient Greece and other civilizations. You Greeks only remember one deluge, but there have been many of water mm. and fire. And we, the more we look back, the more we, we think, well, how many versions of civilizations have come and risen and then been subsequently destroyed? And what I've come to is studying Ionis, the andesite stone built there, comparing it across the world to Tiwanaku and Pumapunku knowing where that time period exists and knowing that it, first of all, can't be younger than 12,000 years old because of the stonework, tools available, time periods, different things like that. And then saying, well, wait a minute though. If Ionis is, is from a, a, an event after a great catastrophe and then it was built, it can't be right after the Younger Dryas because we don't see any emergence of an incredible civilizations after that. If anything, what we see after 12,000 years ago around the world is a more primitive reset, like Graham Hancock says, like species of amnesia, which mm -hmm. means that it had to be another iteration of the flood, a complete other mm -hmm. cycle. And when I started to dial it in and to think, wait a minute, so we have the Sumerian king lot list. The Uruk list of kings and sages, the ancient Egyptian kings list that come out, the Turin king list, we start to add those ages up. We add up the ages that are in Christianity with Enoch. We add up all of this. And what it tells us is that Ionis, in the state that it's in being somewhat preserved, may be the oldest temple on earth, which is why mm. that first cross is there. And I believe that it's well over 20,000 years, well over. And I want to, to actually give you the number. We look at the ages of all this, 
I believe that Ionis, and this is going to be difficult for some to accept, but I had to go back and look at Zeptepi periods of Egypt and different periods of alignment with star systems and different climatic periods. And what I've come up with is that I believe that Ionis is, is potentially 20, 30, could even be 50,000 years old, which would align with these Atlantean narratives from Edgar Cayce and others of this lost chapter in history when it seems to have been like a golden age where information was lowered about ascension and higher consciousness, but also building giant temples and pyramids. And it traveled around the world and they built all these things. But where mm. did it come from? Where did it start? Where did those sages come from? Where did that knowledge come from? That's what's so exciting about this and how I think that Ionis and Kef Temple and Kavis and the, the whole lost era civilization and the connections to Tiwanaku and Pumapunku is gonna be profound enough. And this is a loaded statement. But with experts like Brian, Billy, and Paul, with the amount of money we're going to raise and to have something so high budget to be seen by millions around the world, being followed by something like Ancient Apocalypse, thank you, Graham Hancock on Netflix, this is now a progression to change this narrative so that foundation of sand, like he, like he says, finally collapses. And the mm. entire narrative and doctrine changes. And this film and discoveries that we're going to try to connect here has that potential to do that and that's why it's mm -hmm. so powerful yeah yeah, yeah absolutely wow I, the, I think the flood is a great entry point for a lot of people into these questions and the questions of, of previous civilizations and i know when uh the younger driest cold event really began entering into mainstream conversation uh, a lot of people got very excited and so uh, a lot of religious believers said, oh, this is great. This is an affirmation of, of our flood story because uh, there was there was flooding at the tail end of the younger Dryas. It, it must be that that's being remembered. And then students of Plato said, oh, this is really exciting because the tail end of the younger Dryas coincides with the timeline that yeah. Plato had yeah. for the loss <laughs> of Atlantis. Except that's not the only flooding in, in the planet's story. There would have been massive flooding at the beginning of the Younger Dryas cold period, the events that triggered it. And mm -hmm. in my research, which, as I say, is in ancient texts, indigenous narratives, I find evidence for multiple flood experiences. So you go to Genesis, there's a flood in Genesis 1. There are two floods in Genesis 6, stories that have been fused together. There's another planetary reset in Genesis 11. And in fact, I think by the time you get to Genesis 11, you've read about five planetary resets. Mm. Plato argued that planetary resets were actually a regular occurrence on this planet. And he said every 5,000 years or so, something will happen. Something mm. to do with objects in space impacting the conditions on planet Earth that will mean there's going to have to be a reboot of some kind. So there are breadcrumbs that lead people into this territory. And we, we might start off with what seems a simple picture or a recent picture. But the more you probe, the, realize, the more you realize this is an ancient, ancient story of uh, multiple confusions on our timeline, yeah. multiple impacts on our planet, and I'm so excited to be probing this with you guys in this project because I think there is so much more information that has been carried uh, in our texts, but also archaeologically when we start looking at fire damage and water damage around the planet. And I think yeah. getting further down that rabbit hole is going to be exciting and is going to change our view of the history, not only of humanity, but of the planet. No, for sure. And I think that Brian's going to have a lot to offer to add to that because we're talking about catastrophes, like you say, happening in these cycles. But these megalithic sites still withstanding till this current day, the majority of them. Yeah. So, Brian, in your research, have you seen any evidence of the construction techniques that will allow these megalithic structures to withstand earthquakes and other types of geological disasters? Oh, definitely. But what we also see is actually relates to what Paul was just talking about, and that's fire damage. So we see vitrification, mm -hmm. which is turning stone into glass. And in, mm -hmm. in a lot of locations at Karnak in Egypt, mm -hmm. at uh, 
different sites around Lake Titicaca, we see obvious signs that usually from the east, there was a heat source that came possibly plasma ejection from the sun that struck these sites and partially damaged them way, way, way in the distant past. So um, yeah, there's definitely evidence of that. Um, all of the megalithic st structures tend to be earthquake proof, but I think that's simply a side product. I think again, the original function was, was that these were vibratory structures of some kind, being the energy of the earth channeling itself into the structure and setting up an alternate uh, field of energy inside each one of these structures. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, this is going to guide us, you know, towards a whole new path. Matthew, what are the implications for, you know, us on this planet based on this new information coming out? How is it going to affect us? You know, it's it's difficult to keep building it up in a way where people might be like, that can't be that can't be that big. But honestly, it is because like Paul, if Paul remembers when I pulled him into that fifth kind show and I was like, Paul, look at this. Look at this box relief, this giant stone basalt box from Kef Temple. Right. Check it out. And I remember him like staring at it, and he was kind of quiet for a little while. And we ended up talking about it for like almost an hour, I think. That wow. because on that box, which came from one of the adjacent sites, one of the ancient temples that I think aligns with um, potentially like uh, a rising of the sun and uh, the rising of the sun. And then the other the other temple is represents the setting of the sun. I believe um, that's what their functions were aligned to uh, as I've mm -hmm. been studying the sites. But the box <laughs> itself from Kef seems to be some kind of a um, like a teaching cipher for understanding these not almost like doctrines, but doctrines in a way from a pure, a, a pure standpoint. So a doctrine is just like a set of rules, a set of thoughts and processes here. But this specific set that they seem to have carved precisely into this gigantic basalt box seems to be like a teaching that was passed around the world. And it has these grooves underneath, underneath it that are very bizarre, like it was carried just like the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and it's quite large. It's multiple feet by multiple feet long. It's quite a large box. But on the box has these teachings. And these, these teachings seem to be closely associated with the same types of teachings we see at Ionis, but as like more of like a connection with understanding, um, a wider understanding of what uh, was passed at Ionis. And what I mean by it is that we get these, these symbols that are then shown all around the world. And Brian sees them all over all over Peru and Bolivia and what it is and this is where you start to wrap your head around and get wild here is imagine that these ancient civilizations were embodying the knowledge of something into structures that literally represented aspects of teaching and totalities but also connecting to the stars and creating this unison between heaven on earth and in the kef boxes they have this symbol that is a ziggurat step pyramid has exactly mm. three levels, okay? There are three of them, and each of them has a door in the center, okay? The central ziggurat doorway is precisely above this god Haldi, above on his head, he's got the Florida Lee plumed symbol on his head, fitting mm. into the very center doorway that then above it has the Florida Lee flowering with the two griffins on either edge protecting it. Paul knew exactly what he was seeing when he saw that. He was like, this is an ancient spiritual religious teaching. It's literally not only teaching us about the doorways of energy for how to ascend to reach literally the highest state of energy we can, the highest state of consciousness. That's what those doorways represent. So the three represented what became in Christianity, the triptych or the Trinity, the, the Holy Trinity. And it represents these three aspects of us. And that if we learn to balance these these harmonies of the of the left and the right side of us this masculine feminine energy these different concepts of the totalities of what exists as the the body the soul and the in the mind if we can balance them it showed this flowering of what we become like gods and it was trying to teach us the path to divinity and along with those symbols they have the ziggurat stepped doorway pyramid with the inverted version built right in with also mm. arrows showing up, down, up, down, up, down, showing you the hermetic law constants 
that came out of Hermes, out of the Greek Hermes, which literally I believe Greece came out of this civilization. Because the same mm. griffin symbol, the same symbols we see embodied into the ancient Greek civilization, which, by the way, Plato talks about with Solon, talks about that was a, a civilization that existed in the time of Atlantis. Mm. We're seeing what may be the origins of the Ascension teachings and the mm. origins of religion before it took a very different turn later on. Now, not only that, but Haldi is holding a chalice in his hand. While he's passing, the seeds of knowledge or, or seeds of, of the tree of life, which is shown right next to it, with right above it, this T-shaped pillar over and over again above the tree of life, showing this, this balance of all things. And we see those symbols spreading all around the world from that point. So if we were to study the Kef box relief, which we are, that's why we're going to that museum in Ankara. And we're connecting it to Ionis and all the symbols. And then we can figure out what they mean based on the associated understandings. Brian knows that that, that ziggurat temple symbol, if you combine the, 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 the above symbol with an, the inverted version, becomes the Chicana of South America. It is the exact mm -hmm. same symbol, but they added more levels than the original three. All mm -hmm. the symbols that we find at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku are the same versions but slightly altered with their their own like take on it um and that's what is just very profound because so many people think well we don't really know what these mean we're not we're kind of think this means this or we have an idea that the indigenous groups believe this but what if you find the cipher and origin point of all of it and then mm -hmm. all the symbols around it have the same depictions that we can put like a key in a lock and turn it mm -hmm and open something but what's inside that may be this key to us finally coming together to realize the origin point of who we truly are and what we could become mm -hmm. absolutely so powerful and well said paul what are your feelings on this how this is going to affect us and change the world this these discoveries that we're going to bring forward i am so looking forward to the four of us sitting down in front of that basalt box Me too. because uh just to echo everything that matt just said when matt introduced me to it i i was just rooted to the spot because i realized what we're looking at it's like a um you know it's like a time capsule it's like a message from beyond and the symbology on it it's the story of everything Right, it's exactly. the story of who we are. It's a story of a moment in history. It's a story about our potential. Everything is wrapped up in that box. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Matthew that the heart of every Ascension tradition is, is there, is there on that box. The effect, I, for me, the effect is to have so much more respect for antiquity and for the information that's been carried through the ages from the earliest of times, because Ascension traditions are fascinating. They are often not the main syllabus of a religion or a spiritual tradition. They're certainly not the main syllabus at school. And the story of human migrations, human conquests, the stories of empire, it's difficult to tell those stories without having at the same time to talk about the suppression of ascension traditions, the suppression of shamanic knowledge, the suppression of suppression of indigenous story. And yet somehow these ascension teachings survive and they mm. keep reemerging. And for me, uh, as a student of religious thought, it's fascinating that I can go anywhere on the planet to any culture, to any period in time, and there will be an aspect of previous ancient lost knowledge resurfacing via this mm. indigenous priesthood, via this secret society embedded mm. in this symbology at this site. And to get to the root of all that, the root of the information that will never go away, that is always protected, that always reemerges, is going to be so exciting. I remember, I think it was J.B. Phillips talked about the experience of retranslating the New Testament. And he said it was like rewiring a house with the power still turned on. 
And I think that's the experience we're going to have as we go to the root of all this information, the information yeah. that lies at the heart of every Ascension tradition. And I think because it's at the heart, because it predates everything we've been taught, it has the potential to unify people in a powerful way to release people from narratives that have dominated for a long time, that have kept people bound, controlled, managed, and not exploring, and inspire a whole new era of hunger, appetite, exploration. It is really the information and energy of Renaissance. And yeah. that's that's my grand hope for what's happening <laughs> right now and the information we will find at these sites. That's the energy we will be tapping together. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. And Brian, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, how this will affect uh, civilization on this planet as well? Well, I think to find, you know, what you would might call the source would be ab absolutely profound. Uh, it does make mm -hmm. sense that it would be located in an area such as, as Armenia and, and Turkey, because, um, you know, so many ancient traditions go back that far. I'm eager to... Uh, do a comparison of the symbolism between what is located around that part of the world and what we find in Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. I've seen a few photographs that show from uh, Matthew that show very striking similarities. Mm. So, um, yeah, to see if there's a, an even stronger link would be uh, really interesting. And yeah, just to go to a site that is relatively similar to what I've seen in different parts of the world, but possibly even older would be absolutely profound. And, you know, just from my perspective, my point of view, uh, you know, uh, I remember a few years ago, Matthew, actually the day that we talked about doing the Epic of Humanity book, which is finally out now. Three, uh, three and a half years ago or something? Three and a half years ago. Yeah. I went yeah. up to Maine and hung out with you. We went to a private island. We did a podcast on the myth of Adapa. What where I what I see coming out of this is the knowledge that's encoded into that tablet, not just by reading it and saying, oh, this is what they said, but actually feeling it and experiencing the fact that we are powerful beings, yeah. that we are supposed to seek the light, that the light is already in us and the knowledge is already in us. We just haven't tapped into it fully yet and to be able to help humanity reach its full potential. And so I'm really excited about this opportunity. I'm excited to be part of this team. Uh, and this is, this, to me, this is an all-star cast. I, I'm just um, I'm just really, you know, appreciative to even be a part of this and to be able to go and see these sites. As you know, I love, my passion is traveling. My passion is visiting these sites and doing the research in person. I really, truly believe that's the only real way to get the right perspective and perception of some of these locations, which is why I have so much respect for Brian Forster, because like you said earlier, Matthew, got to give this man credit. He inspired me to go out even further and further and continue to look and, and go out there because every time you turn around, this guy's at another site and it's like, man, this guy's getting to the knowledge. He's getting his hands dirty and that's what it takes. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to get our hands dirty. We're going to bump heads. We're going to, come up with different hypotheses and ideas. We're going to, you know, I remember we did we did a series before, uh, you know, you and I and a few other people. And it was, um, it was, you know, we bumped heads a little bit. We got to figure out like, how do we, how does this congeal? How does it all come together? Uh, but it's going to be so exciting for not only us, but also the people watching to see us begin to put, lay down real research and see what it really takes. Um, you know, that it's not just, uh, you know, you just sit in front of a camera and come up with all these crazy hypotheses that you actually really got to go do some real work and you have to put real knowledge and receipts. I call it receipts behind what you're speaking to come up with these, you know, enough circumstantial evidence that's going to prove a point to the people. Yeah. So I think it's going to take everyone on this journey, you know, uh, and, and it's going to be amazing. And everyone, again, listening right now, whether you're watching or listening, there's a link in this podcast, there's a link in the caption of this video. You can become a part of this journey with us. You can come on this journey uh, with us. You can be a part of this and live through this vicariously through us. You can actually be a part by making a sacrifice, making a donation of $100. We'll list you as a sponsor on the website. And if you make a donation of $500, you actually get a chance to get your name in the credits. You can put, you can sponsor even more than that. 
We'd like for you to be a part of helping us make this a reality. Uh, and we want to produce it at the very highest level that we possibly can. We don't want this to be a Zoom documentary. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what this is. This is going to be on the same level of a Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, Forbidden Knowledge TV, all the all that level. That's what we're talking about. Producing a Hulu level, whatever you want to call it, the level that could be released even in the box office if we wanted to. That's the level of production that we're shooting for. That's what we're going to achieve because we're masters of our own destiny. We truly believe that. And you can be a part of that by clicking that link and becoming a supporter today. Everyone, I wish we could talk for 10,000 more hours, but we can't. But I think that the people who listened to this got a lot out of it. They got to learn a little bit about each one of us. And here's some of our perspective and object objectives on, uh, on this uh, new experience, this new uh, incredible journey we're all going to go on together. And uh, do, does anybody have any final words? People will be sharing a process with us. This is not going to be like a dry documentary. This is how it is. Here is an alternative timeline. There are going to be four four heads, <laughs> four researchers <laughs> uh, bumping up against each other, exploring together, comparing ideas together. Uh, of course, Four individuals never agree 100% on everything. So because of that, we're going to be teasing out the implications of what we're seeing, challenging each other on our interpretations. And I think that's going to be a whole lot more fun than some experts standing behind a lectern saying, this is how it is, everybody. And yeah. that is going to make it a really dynamic experience. People will be sharing our discoveries in real time, as it were as they see us on these sites and having these conversations. Absolutely. Brian, anything you want to say before we get out of here, Brian? No, I just want to thank, uh, thank the three of you for coming together like this. I think uh, this could be somewhat similar to the Beatles, like four aspects coming <laughs> together to, to create a whole body, mind, heart, spirit. I like so, beautiful. I, I look forward to, uh, future discussions with you guys about this. And I'm very excited to be part of this. So thank you all for allowing me to be uh, a member. A great adventure, gentlemen. All right. A great yes. adventure to change history. Absolutely. So you guys heard it, guys and gals, click the link, become a part of this journey with us. Make sure you uh, sponsor. A lot of people, like I said before, always say, I wish I could be a part of something like this. I wish I can help bring more information and knowledge to the world. Well, this is your opportunity to feel like you're part of this, to actually be able to help sponsor this project so we can produce it at the highest level. Everyone, thanks for joining us tonight or today or wherever you are in the world. And we'll be back soon with more information about the Lost Ararat Project or whatever this story or the title is going to be eventually. But you can help support us by clicking that link today.